Flying down onto Antarctica and South America was, was quite a surreal experience. This is not your uh, Qantas flight. This is a, a cargo plane sitting on very rough seats. <laughs> but I can't really complain. It's not as bad as 100 years ago. If I was there, I'd be on a boat tilting at 40, 50 degrees for several weeks, trying to get through the, one of the roughest seas in the world. I'm writing a book on the scientific work done in Antarctica in 1912, looking at the five expeditions that went down there, four of them making a tilt for South Geographic Pole, but all of them making scientific observations, much of which we're still learning from today. These men wrote history on the blank white page of Antarctica. I'm going south to do my own research, investigating a recent geological history of Antarctica. And on the back of that, I hope that I'll actually get some insights into what an amazing experience and how difficult it was to do research over a century ago. I'm working with Dr. Chris Fogwill to collect geological samples to get a handle on what the ice sheet has done over the last 20,000 years or so. And right behind me is Mount Vincent, Antarctica's highest mountain. Chris and I are going to take the skidoos and explore the immediate area, trying to find sites to reconstruct the former ice extent. What we're hoping is that by getting out there, we're going to be able to collect samples and map a part of Antarctica that's not very well known and actually feed some of those results into the book itself. We're connected up by ropes in case one of us falls down a crevasse. Because I must confess, I did actually think back to Mawson's expedition. Mawson went out with two other guys, including a chap called Ninnis, and 300 miles out from their base, Ninnis disappeared down a crevasse. But it just goes to show that this environment is pretty unforgiving and you have to concentrate all the time. In the Ellsworth Mountains, the mountains act like dipsticks. And what we can do is going out and climbing these different mountains, collecting rock scattered across the surface. And these are called erratics, and basically they have a different geology to the local bedrock. And over time, as they're sitting on the surface, they're actually changing their chemistry. And the longer they sit on the surface, the more that chemistry changes. And those rocks must have been brought there by the ice sheet when it was larger. So you walk along, you collect these rocks, and you make a note of what height they're at. And by taking those samples back to the laboratory and measuring the changed chemistry, we can get a handle on the 3D shape of the ice sheet over time and get a handle on what the changes we're seeing today, how they compare to the past. It's very complex how the ice sheet is responding. Some parts are growing, some parts are, are rapidly retreating. And there's strong links between Antarctic climate and the rest of the world, particularly the Southern Hemisphere. So by monitoring changes in uh, what the ice sheet is doing, what the climate is doing in Antarctica, we'll get a global view of what the future might bring. We now have to get to the other side of the Union Glacier. Uh, to a place called the Flower Hills. And the Flower Hills is really important because it's actually next to something called the Rutford Ice Stream, draining a large part of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And it's moving at around a metre a day, so it's quite significant. One of the advantages of going to the Flower Hills is we can collect these erratic seas to actually get a handle on what the ice sheet was doing in this part of Antarctica. The only way the erratics could have got there is that ice in the past has transported it there and then since melted. Chris and I have just climbed the Flower Hills. We've reached an amazing spot. We're about 500 metres above sea level and Chris has just found a fantastic sample. So we've got a big quartzite erratic sat up on, on top of the tillite here. And you can see it's obviously far bigger than anything else on the slope, but it's also got really nicely bashed edges from being under the ice. And basically to get this erratic here, the Rutford Ice Stream would have to buttress any ice from the Ellsworth Mountains to about this altitude, which would mean about 350 metres of potential thickening of the Rutford Ice Stream. We've 
just climbed to 1400 meters and we're actually above the former upper level of the ice sheets. There's no rocks here for their own exotic geology. The surface is just really deeply weathered over time. It's a great example of being able to reconstruct where the ice formerly got to. And of course the view is absolutely spectacular. It's been a huge and successful trip. More than 100 samples, far greater than anything we'd expected to get. And we've got lots of other great data that helps explain how this fabulous landscape evolves.